Right. I would also like to thank the organizers for the invitation also uh, for, having, for giving me a lot to talk here already on the first day. Um, I wanted to talk about, I mean, I've been working on relatability and dialectic for quite a few years now, and one of the things that I like to study is the relationship between these, these two inter group interpretations. But I have always uh, kind of worked with um, total functions. So I, I mainly you work with system T, where everything is, is nicely defined and you don't have the issue of partiality. But it always bugged me that Pliny's original notion of realizability used all total at uh, all computer functions, and in particular it uses uh, partial functions as well. So he, he works with codes for these uh, partial computable functions. And I think a natural question to ask is whether one can have something similar for the dialect uh, interpretation as well. If you look at um, the applications of proof interpretations, like in proof mining, it's mainly used, um, people use total uh, functionals, primitive recursive functionals, system T, T plus bar recursion, and so on. Um, and uh, if you look at the different interpretations, like Godot's interpretation, or the Dilanam, or the monotone function interpretation, the, the Herbrand interpretation, the bounded function interpretation, they all work with total primitive recursive functions. So none, none of them uh, make use of Pliny's original notion of the working with codes of partial computable functions. So that, I think it's a natural question to ask whether working with all computable functions, partial functions, um, could be helpful as well. So maybe um, for proof mining or, or some other applications. And uh, this is something that is quite natural to ask. And uh, I think um, already in 78, Michael Pizan asked this question. And he was trying to understand if you have, um, so it is, in his introduction, he says the essential feature by which the present interpretation can be distinguished from Godot's is this. Godot's interpretation makes use of functions of higher type, all total functions, system T, whereas our interpretation, however, uses partially defined functions. So he was trying to, to make use of Pliny's idea that maybe we can work with uh, all computable functions, but then we have to allow for functions to be undefined. So he was looking at this kind of uh, equation, or looking at this analogy, because around that time, Chrysler had just come up with this modified notion of realizability. So he said, Chrysler looked at Pliny's realizability, and then he looked at Godot's function interpretation, the dialectic interpretation, and then he realized that you, know, you can have a version of Pliny realizability using system T as well, where everything is total, and you don't have to worry about the undefined uh, realizers, um, but then you are within this primitive recursive function, system T. But then one can ask, I mean, if this is kind of related to Godot, they both use the system T, one can ask what, what should be here? What is kind of the version of the dialectic interpretation that makes use of partial functions, but all partial computable functions? Okay? And, um, Michael Bison kind of suggested a solution to this. So he said he, he, we thus found uh, solved this propor proportion. So he claims to have an interpretation. But what I want to point out here is that I think there is a flaw in the, in the solution that he proposes. And uh, I've been trying to think about this for the past year. And I came up with another solution where I don't think it's ideal. But I want to explain the issues around this and the, the problems with Bison's solution, and then maybe if I have time a little bit about how I think uh, a solution should go and one proposal. Okay. Um, so I'll start, I mean, my starting point is the work I've done on uh, um, this unifying function interpretation. So there, I think we gained a lot of insight into the relationship between realizability and dialectic. Yeah? And uh, in particular, it makes it much easier to transfer technologies from one place to the other. So if you know something about realizability and you want to transfer it to the dialectic, 
make use of this unified touch interpretation approach is, is very helpful. But also the other way around as well. And uh, the crucial idea is that uh, realizability is normally presented as um, a formula is interpreted as a set of realizers, whereas for the dialectic, you interpret formulas as relations. So I will, I will go through this because I know not everybody here is uh, an expert in realizability or dialectic. So uh, this will be my introduction. But then my first point is that um, this, the relational view is more general, I think, it's more primitive. And you can define the set interpretation from the relational interpretation. So this is the basis for these unifying uh, proof interpretations that uh, I've worked on. Okay. Once we have that, once we can see Pliny's realizability as a relational interpretation, then we'll try to see how we can then um, make use of, uh, kind of make it more like dialectic. Does it make sense? That's, these are the, the two points I want to make. So as I said, realizability is, is, is defining this relation between formulas and numbers. So it's, it tries to say when a number realizes a formula. And once you have defined that relation that I will present in the next slide, then you can interpret a formula as its sets of realizers. So that's kind of the basis for the effective topos and, and the kind of the semantic view of realizability. But you can also, uh, so this is kind of associated to <coughs> each sentence, so to each formula, uh, a set of realizers. Okay, so that's, that's why I say this is kind of the set view of proof interpretation. So you interpret formulas as sets of realizers. And uh, you can think of it as purely proof theoretically, because this is nothing more than associating to each formula uh, a new formula. So you take a formula of heightened arithmetic and you associate it with a new formula with an extra free variable uh, here called E that says when that formula realizes, when E realizes a formula. Okay? And you do that by induction of the formula. And it's very much kind of a formalization of the BHK interpretation. So you're saying, for instance, uh, the number E realizes a conjunction if E is the code of a project of pair where the first projection uh, realizes A and the second projection realizes B. That's exactly what the PHK interpretation would say. Now with implication you say a number E realizes an implication if whenever I'm given a number realizing the assumption then uh, I can think of E as the code for this partial computable function that then must be defined and it should realize B. So that's kind of the, the that's Kling's definition that will soon be a hundred years old. Do you have a question? Third line looks strange. The third line. Uh -huh. you don't. So this should be a, 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 a <laughs> this should be a disjunction, yes. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so so the, the code witnessing a disjunction, it's a pair that it tells which one you are witnessing and then a witness for the um, And th this is really. Uh, crucial here that uh, you're saying, look, this this E could be undefined if the premise is false. Okay, so you don't need uh, E to always be defined. So only when the the input A is a realizer for A, then E of A needs to be defined. Otherwise, a, E of A could be undefined. And this is crucial, for instance, to interpret Markov principle. Okay, so Kling's realizability interprets Markov principle as well. And just search for a witness, and if there is a witness, you're going to find one. Not then you don't you don't have to worry. Um, now I think one thing that is important to stress here is the way things compose. Okay, so the nice thing about the, these interpretations is the modularity is the way that you if you have a, a proof of A from assumptions gamma, then the realizer for that proof is is kind of taking realizes for the premise and producing a realizer for the conclusion. Okay. Similarly, if you have a proof of B from assumptions delta and A, it's the same. You have a realizer that takes all the realizers for delta, a realizer for A, and produces a realizer for B. And then you can see that composing proofs is the same as composing realizers. Okay. You just uh, 
um, fit them together, and then you get a realizable B from the assumptions delta and gamma. Yeah? Is that clear? <coughs> so, this composition works not just for truth, so if this is kind of a true realizer for gamma, then this will be a true realizer for A, and if these are realizer for delta and A, this will be a realizer for B, but also for totality. Okay, so if these are all defined, then these, and these, if these are all defined and are their realizers, then this will be f of that will be defined and will be a realizer. And if these are all realizers and are defined, then these will be defined. So, so this is propagating not just the truth but also the definedness. Okay, so this is this is crucial here. Now, if you look at the dialectic, as I said, it takes a relational approach. So you, instead of saying, look, these are the weaknesses or these are the proofs of a formula, you think of this as um, defining for each formula, or for each sentence, a relationship between arguments in favor of the truth of the formula and counter-arguments. Okay, so the dialectic interpretation is, is takes this relational approach and treats kind of proofs and counter proofs on the same kind of footing, the same ground. Okay, and we, you're trying to um, work with this. Uh, how does it work? So this is again uh, Gödel's original <coughs> definition, slightly uh, with this small change of notation. So I like to present it in this way, putting the, the arguments and counter-arguments in, in separate positions so that you can clearly see that an argument for a conjunction is a pair of arguments, one for each formula. So you, in order to argue for f and g, you need to argue for f and you need to argue for g. And the counter-argument for f and g is again a pair of, of counter-arguments, a counter-argument for f and a counter-argument for g and so on. Now if you look at implication, the argument for uh, f implies g is a pair of functions. So it's a function v that takes uh, an argument for f and produces an argument for v for g, but also uh, a counter-argument function. So uh, a function z that given a counter-argument for g produces a counter-argument for f plus the, the argument that you've given in, to start with. Okay? So that's... Um, that defines this kind of relation between arguments and counter-arguments for arbitrary formulas by induction. And Gödel's result is that uh, if A is provable, then you can find an argument uh, in system T that beats any counter-argument. So that's, that's Gödel's uh, main result in the direct interpretation. Uh, any questions so far? So, if we look again at the issue of composition, this, this works fine as well. So, we see here that um, we have given a proof of A from assumptions gamma needs to have two realizers essentially. So, you need a realizer that takes arguments for gamma into arguments for A, but we also need from that proof to extract a counter argument function that, given a counter argument for A, will produce counter arguments for, for the assumptions. And uh, if you look inside here, we see that the G, so the counter-argument function, needs to know which argument it's refuting. So the counter-argument function takes not just the counter-argument for A, but also the argument for gamma. And this is mainly because of the contraction. So we can use these assumptions many times in the proof. And we need, when we're refuting an assumption, we need to know which assumption we are refuting, in some sense, where we are in the proof. So that's kind of the main reason why we don't have a, a symmetric, uh, we don't have a symmetry here. So the G needs to know the, the gamma, the arguments for gamma, because we can use this gamma many times. When you go to classical linear logic, for instance, all is, is all very symmetric, but not in, in, in intuitionistic logic. But then composition works fine as well. So if you have a function that takes arguments for A into arguments for B, and you have an H that takes arguments for B into arguments for C, we can simply put these together, 
and uh, take an argument for A into uh, an argument for B, and then composing with H, we get an argument for C. But also, giving a counter argument for C, we can again use the counter argument function K and the argument for B to produce a counter argument for B. And we can also use the function, the counter argument function G to take the argument for A and the counter argument for B to produce a counter argument for A. Does it make sense? So the, you kind of, the flow goes this way and then back, but you have kind of uh, some interference between the arguments and the counter arguments because of the contraction issue. <coughs> now, one issue here is that um, you see that if any of these f, g, and k is undefined, this, this counter argument will be undefined as well. Okay, so whenever anything in a, in a term is undefined, the whole term will be undefined. So I, want, I just want to point out this because this will be one of the issues in business uh, proposal. So why, what do I mean by the relational view is more general? So what, uh, what I've shown is that you can present Kreisel's modified realizability in a relational way as well. Okay? So you can present it in such a way that it is a, a, a definition based on arguments and counter-arguments, just like with the dialectical. And the only difference is in the interpretation of implication. Okay? So with the dialectical, you're trying to give counter arguments uh, to refute the, the fact that y is an argument but with the with the realizability uh, you're saying well i don't care if i have if there exists an, a counter argument i'm happy so you don't witness that counter argument uh, for all set in the premise of verification but you can show that this is just the dialectical with this definition for implication and if you change the definition to to forget about the counterexample, then you get realizability. So it's kind of a way to, to see where exactly the, these things differ. So first thing I did was to, to do the same for Pliny's realizability. So I was thinking, is it possible to define Pliny's realizability in a relational way? There's a kind of a relationship between arguments and counter-arguments. And this is indeed possible. So you can say, uh, you can view Pliny's realizability also as a relation between two numbers. So you have a number that codes an argument for the formula, and you can have another number that codes a counter argument for the formula. And uh, you can present Pliny's numerical realizability as a relationship between these codes. Okay. And again, it's, it's very similar, and it's easy to show that uh, a code realizes A in Pliny's sense, if and only if that code beats any counter-argument in this sense. Okay. So, once we have done this, then you can see exactly, and actually you can make more precise business question. So you can say now, can I witness this B here? Right? Just like Google did. Can I witness the B as a function? <laughs> so, that's kind of the, the challenge. So this, you have kind of cleaning numerical realizability like this, and you want to be able to witness that counter argument B as part of your witness as your argument. Okay. So one natural kind of first attempt is to say, well, let's just think of the, the code E as a pair of functions, just like with the dialectic. So you have a pair of functions. Uh, the first component is kind of taking an argument for f and producing an argument for g. And the window only needs to be defined when the premise is true. But it also, the e also has a second component that um, produces a counter argument for f, giving a counter argument for g and the argument for f. Okay. Uh, and again, we we want this only to be um, if if the player, let's say, if the if the proponent plays something which is undefined, then he will lose. Okay, so that's the idea. So in particular, if he plays undefined things, so this will be false, but the premise will be true. So we want to force the opponent not just to win by playing undefined, and that's why this this appears here as a premise of the premise. Because if the player plays undefined, then he loses. 
Now, obviously, uh, as you can, if you know uh, about the dialect, that this is not going to work because in order to precisely witness uh, the counter-argument function, uh, we need to have decidability. So that's, that's the, the contraction issue with the dialect, yeah? that we are not going to be able to witness this precisely because we need to decide uh, which, which of two witnesses is the real witness, and we can only do that if formulas are decidable. But here you see that being defined is sigma 1, so it's not, it's not going to be decidable. So these things are not going to be decidable. Um, so Pizan's solution was, I mean, one, one then might say, well, how about working with uh, sets, just like with the Dylan? And I think Pizan went in the same direction. He realized this and he said, let's work with sets. So you could say this counter argument is not really a precise counter argument, but it's really a set of counter arguments that kind of contains one possible real counter argument. Okay? Um, you, you think this should work, and the problem is that it doesn't, because again, when you are interpreting the contraction axiom, you, you need to be able to do the union of these sets. And the issue here is that you might have, uh, when, when this is undefined, you would like to think of this as the empty set. Okay? If, the, if, if the player played something undefined, then it means uh, you think of this as like, you know, this, this is like the, un the, the empty set. But when you have the union of an empty set with a non-empty set, you want that to be the non-empty set. But when things are undefined, Whenever you have something which is undefined, then the whole thing is undefined. So the union of sets doesn't work. Does it make sense? So, so you, you again have an issue that you're still not able to interpret the contraction axiom because you're not able to take the union of these sets in, a, in the way that you would like. Okay? Because if one of them is undefined, then the whole thing is undefined. And this doesn't work. So Bison's solution was to say, well, let's Let's work in such a way that the counter argument functions are always total. Okay. So he says, let's, let's let the, the, the argument functions to possibly be undefined, but the counter argument, they have always to be total. Okay. So that was his solution. And indeed, if you had that, then you'd be able to take union of sets and everything would work fine. The issue is that then you, you have problems with the composition. As you can imagine in my slide uh, about composing things, um, if, the, if the argument functions are allowed to be partial, you are not going to be able to, to guarantee that the counter argument functions are always total because these things, they, they mix up. Okay? They, you need to, to combine argument functions with counter argument functions to produce counter arguments. So that's the issue, and if you look at Bison's proof, again, when, when he deals with the, the case of uh, composition, A plus B and B plus C plus A plus C, this argument is not, not sound, because at some point he says, well, this should be defined, but you can't guarantee that it is defined. So just to conclude, um, we need somehow to produce this set. So I'm calling it here just a W because we don't know what it should be yet. So we need to come up with a W set that, um, that we want to use to define a kind of a set of possible counterexamples. But we need to form a finite union of these sets in order to interpret the contraction axiom. So we, we need to be able to take two W sets and do the union of those sets. In order to deal with composition, we also need to do the union of W sets indexed by a W set. So that's, that's how we deal with composition. And uh, again, in, in, in the composition, because you, things can be undefined, we need to be able to move a bounded quantifier over a conjunction when, when this formula when one of the formulas doesn't have that, that y is a free variable. But you can only do that if these double sets are non-empty. So we need to guarantee that we are working with non-empty sets. So it's, I, I kind of draw up this list of requirements and I try to come up with um, a possible solution. And the only thing that I came up with that actually works and is sound, but 
in my view, is not very interesting. I don't have any applications of this whatsoever. But maybe I'm here for the whole week. If you have any ideas on how to improve this, or if you have applications of this, I'll be happy to discuss this in, in, in more detail. Is that uh, you think of the counter argument function as uh, you look at the, the counter argument function as a function, and the, the sets are going to be the image of that function. Okay, so you say um, for if every time e is defined on x and some index i, then you put that in the set. So you think of the, the image, but we are not able to bound that set. So it might not be finite sense. But um, we can, I think, guarantee by induction, if you start with finite sets on the axiom, that everything will be finite, because all the constructions take finite set to finite sense. So it's kind of, you can guarantee that these sets are finite on the meta level, but not in the in the interpretation. And we need to include the zero because otherwise this could be empty. Okay. So this bounded quantifier turns out to be something like this. So you need that A holds at some point, and here I'm taking zero. But then whenever E is defined on some input xi, then uh, A holds for that value. Okay. And if you take that as uh, for your interpretation of implication, you get uh, um, an interpretation that works in the sense of being sound and non-trivial. But as I said, uh, I don't really have any applications. And my motivation was purely kind of out of curiosity, trying to fill that gap in business paper. So just to summarize, it is possible to present Clinton's realizability in a relational kind of way, as a relationship between arguments and counter-arguments. And it might be useful to do this also semantically, I and mean, for people who work with topos theory and so on, to see what does that mean in, in that setting. Um, but here are some kind of mainly the issues that one has to deal with when trying to witness the counterexample function or the counter argument function in this partial setting. Is that uh, you know the matrix will not be decidable because we have, we have these predicates that say this is defined and this is a sigma one predicate. Uh, we can't assume that counter argument functions are total because if you are allowing the argument function to be partial, then these, these things would be mixed up. And, uh, and the, the crucial thing is that you can't um, allow the, the sets to be undefined sets. You really have to work with defined sets of possibly undefined elements, if that makes sense. So, and these sets must be known as this. So this is kind of my summary of the talk. Do you have any questions? And uh, also to compare with Jensen proof? More convincing in, in or less convincing? Convincing in which sense? Uh, for you. Who do you want to convince? <laughs> your I think it, I think it, they are just different uh, different uh, ways of of looking at things. I don't think you can say one is better than or one is more convincing than the other. Because it's I think if you want to, to think of the BHK interpretation, I think Clinton's realizability is more convincing because it talks about all the effective operations, and I think that captures uh, the BHK interpretation better. But when you are working with um, Godel's dialect interpretation system T, it's, it's very good for applications, for instance, for making sure that the realizers are, are of low complexity, and so, so it has advantage and disadvantage. No. No. Yeah, this is, this is as I forgot to mention this is work in progress, so that's why I'll be happy to talk to people uh, who might be able to help me with this, because I, I don't think this is a final solution. Uh, when one looks at type theory it is somehow based on realizability. Could one think of some super type theory 
built on dialectical hermeneutics context samples. This is one of the things that I always think about is that, as you said, I mean, we are often used to think of computations as always going forward. So, you know, you compute with things and then you reach a result. But could one take that relational approach and think of computations also kind of going back? And I think this has a lot to do, for instance, I mean, this is why the dialectic goes really well with uh, continuation passing style. Uh, interpretations and so on, because it takes into consideration the, this idea that one might have to go back, one might have to, to backtrack. And uh, by having argument functions and counter-argument functions, makes it very easy to think in terms of continuations and so on. So, but yeah, it's a really good question. Something that I often think about is like whether one should also have code types, types and code types, and re yeah. a, a kind of a more general notion of type theory where is relational instead of just saying that something belongs to a type. It belongs to a type relative to some counter type. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. I'm asking especially because when looking at the Marvel universe, there is somehow you reach somehow uh, this totality oh, requirement yeah. and relativity to uh, realize us reaches a problem. So maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, as, as, I, as I pointed out, I mean, the set kind of theoretic view is, the, the, the relational view is more basic. You can always define the, the set view by saying that something, the set of realizes is all the things that fit all counter arguments. Mm -hmm. But the relational view is even more basic. I would even call it like the core of realizability. Um, maybe that, this was already answered. So what do you mean by your system works? It means it sounds sound, the same, but the same theory sound, as the as yeah, the like you take up a proof in height in arithmetic, yeah. and you can find a realizer and provably in height in arithmetic, yeah. and, you can and it's not trivial. The, the same axioms, like in the, in I the haven't looked at the, I haven't looked at the uh -huh. characterizing principles okay. because it, <coughs> this is more a comment rather than a question. But then you probably know already about this. But I wanted to mention the thesis of body mirroring in, in Copenhagen. You know, yeah. she was a student. Oh, okay, because she tried to connect uh, realizability and dialectica using triprocess. Yeah, I think uh, she was trying to use kind of the one plus monads to try to capture undefined. And um, yeah, I had some correspondence with that because I think her first solutions actually was there were some issues as well that she had to correct because yeah. it's yeah, it's, it's a subtle point. Yeah, I know about. It. Uh, you mentioned partial functions uh, that should be present in any realizability, and you also mentioned Prizel's modified realizability, which talks about higher objects. Now, then you come to uh, implication, and you want to say whenever I have a realizer for A, then this is mapped to a realizer for B. Now, this is assumed that a realizer for A also assumed to be computable. Can code it somehow, or do you want to have a general realizer with an A like a choice function? Um, so, if you are thinking purely proof theoretically, you know, it's just a, a, an assumed realizer, it's yeah. just a free variable. So, if you're thinking semantically, it depends on, like, on which model you'll be working on. Yeah. But um, you just, it depends, I think, I think when, if you're thinking proof theoretically, there is no issue because it's just a, an assumption. X is a realizer for A, yeah. F of X will be a realizer for B. If you're thinking semantically, then you might be able to put more restrictions on X. Yes. So, uh, so there's this, this nice uh, description of uh, dialectic and linearity, and uh, in particular the fact that uh, the function was commuted. And I was wondering how you. Could so say that there is a so so and one way to understand uh, the difficulty with the compaction is to uh, uh, decompose dialectica using linearity yeah. and understanding the fact that uh, you need to use the, the argument to compute the counter argument as a, a construction of an exponential model. Yeah. So I was wondering whether you have something like this. Or yeah. What? So I because I uh, I also try to carry out that work on unified function interpretation on the linear logic setting. And I think that was really helpful because 
it shows you that um, actually pure linear logic, all these interpretations coincide. Uh, and it's only in the interpretation of the exponential that we have a difference, because it's, that's where the contraction is. But here, uh, the issue already happens, for instance, on, on the linear implication, because you have the function space, right? and then you have partiality already there. Right? And then, um, and because we need to work with finite sets already to deal with, uh, with this, I tried to do this in the linear logic setting and it didn't work because even starting from pure linear logic, you needed contraction to realize things and you needed to work with finite sets. But if you are around, I'll be happy to discuss that <laughs> during the week. I was wondering why you want to compute the finite set of um, realizers. Would it not be an option to just extract, to, to, to just give a function which enumerates a set of realizers and then once you have a proof in a given theory, maybe you can extract a bound of the size of the realizing set. I mean, maybe in some sense, this, kind of what you're doing, right? in some sense this, this E is enumerating the possible real uh, counter arguments. And that's, that's what we are doing here. So this, this set, I'm, I'm, I'm not actually able to, to search this set. Right? It's just an enumeration, and one of these is a counter argument, but I don't know which one. But it's, it's exactly in a partial setting, might it be an option to kind of build that in at an earlier stage? Uh, which earlier stage? Well, not, not compute a set of realizers by computable function, but just compute a function which enumerates realizers, kind of to hardwire it more into the interpretation. I think this E is enumerating the, the realizers. So I, I think what, what is happening here is exactly what you're suggesting, I think. But maybe I didn't understand the question. Okay, no more questions then. Thank you again.